What we're going to look at today is the tolerance zones associated with circularity and cylindricity. So if you understood straightness and flatness, uh, you can see a relationship between those two and circularity and cylindricity. Uh, in terms of circularity, you can think of the straight line as being uh, bent around to form a circle. And for cylindricity, think of, uh, for instance, the label on a can you're taking a plane and bending it around a cylinder. So if you think of that relationship, the tolerance zones will be quite similar to what we've already seen. What we'll look at is circularity of a part feature surface with some type of axis of symmetry. Uh, clearly, if there is going to be circularity, you're going to need an axis to describe uh, what it's circular about. And so an axis is going to play a central role there. We could also have circularity of a spherical part feature. And when I say spherical, it doesn't have to be an entire sphere. It could be a portion of the sphere, a hemisphere, or some quadrant of that sphere. And then lastly, we'll look at cylindricity of cylindrical part features. First, for circularity, you'll also see this referred to as roundness. And in roundness, we're dealing with a zone shape that represents a 2D annulus. Now, when I think of a 2D annulus, I'm thinking of this ring shape here. So an annulus is a ring in two dimensions. And clearly, we need to have some features that have a radial symmetry. By radial, again, we're referring to an axis of symmetry. So you can see here in some examples, for instance, uh, the cone feature. If I have uh, some section of a cone, a conical feature, then we're dealing with an axis going down the uh, center of that cone. So here's my axis going down the center of this cone. And now if I look at each cross-section perpendicular to that axis, I would say that it's circular. In this knob here, we see a, a spherical feature attached to a cone or frustrum. And now we're concerned about a center point here. And then we'll look at intersections of planes with that center point. Here I've got a classical axial part, right? And so here we see an axis of symmetry. And again, as I take cross sections, we're going to control the circular shape. Note what's happening in each cross section. So this bat here, it has an axis of symmetry. And each cross section as I go down that axis is circular, but the radius is changing. Now that doesn't affect the notion of shape, we're not concerned about the size of the feature. We're only concerned about shape. So when we're using these shape tolerances, make sure that you understand you're not concerned about position or orientation or size, but you're worried about the shape. <clears throat> the tolerance size is less than the part feature dimensional tolerance. And that just makes sense in terms of tighter control. So you're not going to see a tolerance size greater than that. And then it's going to be have an orientation. Now, this is the only shape feature that we've looked at so far that does have this orientation. And the orientation is perpendicular to the axis of that part feature. So if the axis bends, right, we have an axis that looks like that. Then we have to take the perpendicular to that. And as you can see, it's changing. The orientation of the tolerance zone is changing. Clearly, location is not considered, and therefore we can have cross sections that move up and down as we go down the axis. So we're not concerned about that. Also note, you cannot use the M or the L for material condition if you're dealing with circularity. The special case of spherical features, or uh, we think of roundness of a ball, so to speak, if we look at the sphere, it has a center point. And if I pass a plane through that center point, then we're going to end up with a circle. 
a cross section of that sphere. And then we're going to check the circularity of that cross section. Now, if we do that an infinite number of times with planes in every orientation, then you can see that we would cover this entire sphere with an infinite number of cross sections. Now, in terms of actually inspecting that spherical feature, you're not going to take an infinite number of circles, but you're going to take a sample of that, and we'll get to that uh, later on in the semester. Again, 2D tolerance zone, and we're passing a plane through the center point, so we are uh, locating that tolerance zone with respect to, uh, or I should say we're locating the plane with respect to that, but the tolerance zone itself, its location can shift depending on which cross-section we have. So you can imagine a spherical feature that is not perfect. This uh, 2D annulus is going to move as we intersect with a plane. If we look at uh, circularity of a cross-section, uh, so we're going to take one specific cross-section of, let's say, an axial feature, then what we're doing is we're having direct control over the shape of the surface. And we can see that here in this 2D annulus uh, that we have, and this red uh, wiggly red line here represents the actual surface. And as you can see, we have deviations in that surface. Obviously, I've exaggerated that so you can see what could happen here. There's no control over the axis. Why is that? Because each cross-section is independent of the previous cross-section. But we are controlling the surface at that cross-section. So we have independence here, and the cross-sections are going to be oriented perpendicular to our features. Just like we said with straightness, the surface must lie within the annulus, whereas with straightness, it had to lie between two parallel lines here. Think of the two parallel lines as wrapping around a circle. And we have two concentric circles with this obvious relationship. So the width of the tolerance zone T, which is reflected in 0 0.05 here, that is static. It will never change. So you can't have a dynamic width. But what can happen is R2 and R1 can change. The difference between the two is constant. It's a fixed value of t. So r2 minus r1 is always equal to t. And we expect that these two values will increase uh, <clears throat> or decrease depending upon the diameter of that circular uh, cross-section. Well, you can kind of see the effect of the tolerance zone size on the outcome here. And the way I've described that is by fitting a polygon with equal sides within the tolerance zone. So when we start with uh, wide tolerance zones, we can get away with fewer sides to the polygon. And as we decrease the width of the tolerance zone, we're having to increase the number of sides of the polygon. And you can see the progression here. If I uh, decrease it further, then I'm going to increase that. And as we uh, decrease it all the way to zero, then you're going to have a perfect circular cross-section. So what we're really allowing for here is uh, deviations where we could have flat sides of that uh, circular cross-section, and it would still satisfy our tolerance zone size. Well, if you understand circularity, then cylindricity just takes that into three dimensions. You can see here we <clears throat> have an axis of symmetry on this piston. And therefore, I've got a cylindrical part feature. If I look at this uh, part over here, there could be multiple cylindrical features, such as this outer surface, or perhaps this inner surface, or this outer surface here. So we can have multiple cylindrical features, and each one of those could represent uh, some type of shape that we want to control with the cylindricity tolerance. The shape of the cylindricity is a 3D annulus. So think of it as taking the 2D annulus and extruding that along an axis. 
So we'll include all the longitudinal surface elements. By longitudinal, we mean going down the surface here. Simultaneously, we're including all of those in the 3D annulus. You can also think of that 3D annulus as a tube that we're going to uh, try to fit the surface in. Clearly, if we're going to have a cylindrical surface, we need to have a surface of revolution about an axis. And it has to be constant if it's going to be a cylinder. Location and orientation of this, this cylindrical tolerance zone are not considered. So they're not applicable. And also, to make life simple for you, material condition also does not apply if you're using cylindricity. So this is what it's going to look like, and you probably recognize this as the cylindrical tolerance. Again, similar to circularity, we have a static tolerance. There's no dynamic tolerance possible. So here's a simple example. We're going to directly control the surface of this cylinder, and we know that because we have a leader that's pointing to that surface, and we have our cylindricity tolerance zone. We have a fixed width, 0 0.05, and now as you can see, this region, this 3D annulus, has to contain the entire surface. Well, when I look at that, essentially what you're doing is indirectly controlling the axis, how straight that axis is, as you decrease the width of this tolerance zone. Because we're applying it over the length of the feature, whereas the circularity was just applied to individual cross-sections. So the tolerance zone size, again, is going to be less than the dimensional tolerance on this. So if we had a dimensional tolerance associated with the diameter of this cylinder, that is strictly greater than our 0 0.05. And again, that's consistent with our notion of geometric tolerance, that they provide tighter controls over the geometry. Similar to circularity, all points on the surface must lie between two concentric cylinders. The key point that, in terms of difference here, though, it's over the entire length, and therefore we have two concentric cylinders over that entire part feature. However, we don't consider any location or orientation of the part feature with respect to another part feature. And so we can think of the tolerance zone as floating. In other words, I can orient it. I can uh, rotate this cylinder or position it, this 3D annulus. I can rotate it. I can move it. As long as the entire part feature is within, contained within the space between those two concentric cylinders, then it's going to be within tolerance. So similar to flatness, we have no orientation or position. So here are two questions that you should be able to answer at this point. First of all, I look at a surface and it satisfies a uh, circularity tolerance of some width. Then I want to know, will it satisfy a cylindricity tolerance also having the same width? And then the complement question here is, Suppose I have a surface that satisfies a cylindricity tolerance of a known width. Will it satisfy a circularity tolerance having the same width? Now, at this stage, you should be able to answer this question and give a reason uh, why. So the key concepts we looked at today were some simple shape tolerances. Circularity, 2D. cylindricity, 3D, and then we see a relationship between circularity and cylindricity if you answered those questions correctly. In summary, we can think of circularity looking at individual cross-sections of some surface, and we will control those surfaces directly. Cylindricity is going to control the entire surface and indirectly control the straightness of that axis. Don't forget, material condition does not apply. In other words, if you see an M or an L in the feature control frame, that is a mistake, right? So that's a problem. And again, you should be looking at any design specification carefully to ensure that it's complete and there are no mistakes in it. So if you see an M or an L there, then there are a couple possibilities. One, uh, it's the wrong symbol. It shouldn't be circularity or cylindricity. Or uh, someone left these in there and they should be removed.